In the summer of 1749, the Swedish naturalist Per Kamm visits the valley of the St. Lawrence and is enchanted by what he sees. The country on both sides was very delightful, and the fine state of its cultivation added greatly to the beauty of the scene. It could really be called a village, beginning at Montreal and ending at Quebec, which is a distance of more than 180 miles. Most of the inhabitants live on seigneuries, large farms along the river. For 35 years now, no enemy has attacked the St. Lawrence Valley. The population is steadily growing and life is comfortable. Many sons of the pioneers have become large landowners. On the colony's first highway, the King's Road, it takes four days to travel from Quebec to Montreal. This is a good country for crops. The colony now supplies all its own food, with enough wheat and peas left over to send to the French colonies in the Caribbean. Père Cam has spent nine months in the English colonies. What impresses him most about Canada is the behavior of its people. The difference between the manners of the French in Canada and those of the English in the American colonies is great. Here, the gentlemen and ladies, as well as the poorest peasants and their wives, are called Monsieur and Madame. The men are extremely civil and take their hats off to every person whom they meet in the streets. In 1749, when Calm visits, New France has a population of 50,000 people. The English colonies have 20 times more, almost a million. Despite the enormous difference in size, Calm sees a glowing future for the little French colony. It is true that the inhabitants are poor, but they love their king. Anyone who notices that all the dwellings in Canada are filled with children, and that the men and women of French origin are better made than anyone else to have children, anyone who considers to what extent the Canadiens are alert, joyful, courageous, able to withstand any hardship that person must also foresee that Canada will soon become an extremely powerful country and the Rome of the English provinces. Other visitors, like the French Jesuit Pierre-Francois Xavier de Charlevoix, are less impressed. Their carefree attitude, an aversion to sustained work, and a spirit of independence, these are their most obvious weaknesses. It is as though the air one breathes in this vast continent contributes to them but their contact with the natural inhabitants is more than enough to shape this character. The Jesuits have had a college in Quebec since 1635, where the same curriculum is taught as in France, but the young Canadians prefer a more practical education. Many are convinced that they are not suited to the sciences that require considerable diligence and sustained study but no one can deny the rare genius for the mechanical arts. They almost need no teacher to excel, and every day we see some of them succeed in every trade without even an apprenticeship. After more than a century, the Canadians have made their peace with winter. 
For six months, they are free from work in the fields, free to relax and socialize. But not all the Canadians love winter. I tremble at the thought that we are stuck with snow for the next nine months. I'd rather be in France. At least I wouldn't be exposed to freeze and die in a pile of snow. Elizabeth Begon, widow of the governor of Trois-Rivières, hates the cold. Yet she was born here and is a member of the new local aristocracy. Everyone is hoping to shine at the ball that we expect Monsieur Bigot will give here. Monsieur Bigot is causing a lot of expenses, for there are not enough teachers here for all those who wish to learn how to dance. The colonial upper class models itself after the French aristocrats who come here, like the new intendant, Francois Bigot. They live in a world of balls, flirtations, and scandal. Would you believe it, that devout Madame Vercher held a dance that lasted all through the night? Our priests are going to have something to preach about, to hold a ball on the Feast of Notre Dame. What is even better is that tomorrow, there is another at Madame Lavaltrie's, and the day after tomorrow, at Madame Bragelogne's. In 1750, Elizabeth Begon's wish comes true. She moves to France, free at last of the Canadian winter she so detests. But she is soon disappointed. In France, I believed that with money, one could have anything one wanted. But in truth, I find that things here are better than in Canada, only in December, January, and February. Everything else is worse. The aristocrats of Versailles give her a nickname, L'Iroquoise. She will never return to Canada. Seventeen forty nine was a good year for the people of New France. But far away, great forces are being set in motion, forces that will shatter their lives. <laughs> 